Services. Now, some of you may have expected Kelly Edwards to be presenting. I'm taking her place and I hope that's not too disappointing, um, but I'll, uh, I'll do my best to fill um, her shoes. Now, the um, topic that we chose was um, ambitious and uh, it could perhaps be summarised by us promising that we will tell you how to make sure that your clients were never confronted with an unfair dismissal case or an adverse action claim. Now, can I uh, tell you immediately that we will not achieve and uh, we'll aim um, a little bit smaller. Um, Lucy's going to talk to you firstly about um, procedural fairness um, in the context of dismissals. She's either going to tell you that it's really important or that it's completely unimportant. I'm not sure. I haven't decided yet. Okay. I'm not sure what Lucy's thesis is. I think there are good arguments on um, both sides of the record, but um, we'll find out from Lucy. I'll then uh, say something about adverse action claims, the real basics of what they involve, and then uh, talk about some of the practical features of um, dealing with them. But um, let's um, start with Lucy. I should say we're aiming for an hour. Um, Max, Lucy says. Um, we're trying to keep it um, nice and um, tight. Uh, drinks outside. Um, downstairs, the World Cup people will have us. If you'd like to stay for a little time or a long time afterwards, you're welcome to. And of course, Lucy and I are happy to chat about any of these issues or anything else um, afterwards as well, if you stay around. Thanks, Lucy. G'day. I'm actually not even going to pretend to give advice on how to avoid an unfair dismissal application. That might be of some use if people were in-house, but the reality is for pretty much everyone here, by the time the claim gets to you, it has already been comprehensively stuffed up by the employer at first instance or whatever's happening. Um, there are in fact two aspects to what I'm going to talk about. The first is dismissals relating to poor performance. I want to look at what, how that's actually addressed by the Commission. It's more of a vexed area than people think. There's a fair bit of complexity there. And secondly, some of the things you can do to um, prevent difficulties or make the case go as easy as it can. Um, secondly, procedural fairness. It's significance in unfair dismissals under the new, I say new, the decade old statutory regime. And then just some do's, don'ts and my favourite deeply procedurally unfair, unfair dismissals, so that they're not great cases, but they are sort of amusing. Starting with valid reason, the, sta the statement of principle that's used, that's still used, comes from Crozier and Palazzo Corporation, decided in 2000 by the old Australian Industrial Relations Commission. Um, I'm not going to read that quite boring paragraph out, but that's the one that's quoted in every decision. What Crozier stands for is the idea that Dismissal based on performance goes to the employee's capacity, their ability or inability to do the job. Um, there's some nuance there. But it's a more interesting case than that extract reveals and that really the most people talk about because it does explore every aspect of a performance based dismissal. Uh, Mr Crozier was a salesperson employed by a storage company. They sold racking and sort of inexplicable transport uh, solutions. He was employed for about a year. His job, his only job, is to generate sales, to bring people into the business. He's the primary salesperson. In that calendar year, he makes one sale. It is worth $1,300. He's brought in after the, shortly after that sale is made, which for him, he would have thought things are going well, finally, in this job that I am objectively terrible at. He's brought in and sacked immediately. The company does what we would generally think of in the context of a performance-based dismissal as every single thing wrong that it can. It never warns him, it never goes to him. You're a salesperson, you are failing to sell anything. You should be troubled by this, we're looking at you. It doesn't give him any opportunity to improve. It doesn't, they pay him notice in lieu. It really is, sorry, we are desperately disappointed in you. See you later. And then they tick the wrong box on the form, the, the Centrelink form saying why you were dismissed. They say it's due to a shortage of work. It emerges in the case that there is a shortage of work and it's because he's failing to bring any sales in, so it's more that it's his fault. Um, nevertheless, that dismissal's upheld. Um, every argument that Crozier runs about procedural fairness, a point I'll return to, every argument he runs about process, unfair targets, not knowing what's going on, 
is rejected because it was just apparent to the Commission that he could not perform this role. He was incapable of it for one reason or another. That comes through in the legislation now. We'll come back to 387 a bit later, but it is conventionally, if you're running an unfair dismissal in relation to an employee's performance, the conventional approach is to address it as a question of capacity. This is not always the case. It's not always the approach that's taken. Sometimes it is done as a misconduct <coughs> question. Um, for example, you see people who have a performance error, they they make mistakes, they, uh, there's a safety breach, they're given a warning for misconduct, or instead it's actually not performing to a particular standard. Um, Valenzuela is a relatively recent decision of no tremendous significance, but it does illustrate this binary. There you have Ms Valenzuela who applies for a job as a professional accountant, a job that does in fact require you to be a professional accountant, and indeed when she applied for it she said she was a professional accountant. You can guess what she obviously wasn't, didn't have that qualification, didn't have anything near the qualification, and correspondingly could not do the job of a professional accountant. It turns out it is something that you need training to be able to do. Um, Deputy President Hamburger in that decision, he it's cast by the employer as a misconduct situation. For some reason they focus on her performance rather than not being an accountant and lying about being an accountant, which for my part I would have been spending a bit more time on. Uh, he d does spend some time going through why it's about poor performance and her actual inability to do it. He then finds the dismissal fair on about 17 different grounds for fairly obvious reasons. Um, what happens with performance? And this is slightly before dismissal, the point if they don't just take them out back and say, see you later. Uh, there are a number of common complaints that are raised by employees at the initial stage of performance management, but also even if it is a surprise after dismissal. Um, the first one is always, I've been working here for 10 years, I've always performed my job like this, Mr Crozier, I've never sold anything and no one's complained about it. Um, what this tends to be is poor human resources management. They've been doing a substandard job for some time, but it's all right and it's a difficult conversation and there's all sorts of things going on. So in fact, the good record is more a lack of complaint. Secondly, that there was no support or training provided. Often arises when people have been placed on performance improvement plans, particularly when those plans don't have necessarily clearly identifiable or trackable goals. They just go, how am I meant to do this? The performance improvement plan says stop being such a dickhead all the time and I find that personally very difficult and I've not been given a course on how to do that. Um, that is an actual example. Uh, and again, it's about that lack of follow through at the initial stages, but often when it comes to you and it is too late, the response to it is, well, what training could you possibly have been given? What have you demonstrated any ability to step forward? Um, thirdly, probably the most fruitful ground for applicants is unreasonable targets. Targets that are either far too high relative to their colleagues, relative to, to what's actually achievable, far too high for them as an initial phase. So that you, can, you don't go from Mr Crozier selling 1300 bucks worth of scaffolding in a year to hundreds of thousands of dollars, there is a bit of a ramp up in performance. Um, or they just don't make any sense, they're really amorphous, they go, well your, your improvement goal is go from being very bad to being acceptable, we'll leave that to you. Um, that can hopefully, if you're brought in early enough in the process, be addressed by a rigorous performance improvement plan, which as we all know is torture to administer, but a necessary thing to do if you want to really see someone out. Um, or have them improve, which does occasionally happen, um, or later in the game by evidence demonstrating that other employees are meeting these goals, they, are, they do make sense, they are achievable. Formal warnings. I'm going to talk about this more in procedural fairness. There is a conception that with performance it's drop dead necessary to have warned the person giving them an opportunity to approve, and of course that does form part of the criteria in section 387. That itself, the fact that you haven't warned someone, that it is a surprise to them, that you've just got sick of this useless employee, is not itself going to affect a finding of valid reason. You can still sack him. It just goes to whether it was otherwise unfair. When it's actually going to be otherwise unfair is if the warnings would have made a difference. And you return to that capacity concept. If it's a warning, they would have gone, they, oh, I didn't realise I needed to do that as part of my job and I would improve accordingly. Or it's a warning, please stop being so inherently unsuitable for the role, please stop being not in fact a chartered accountant. It wouldn't have made a difference. She's not going to get an MBA or whatever the qualification is in the two-week improvement period. 
Where it can assist is with proof, and that's why it's often, apart from giving people a chance, and the goal is often is ob- is obviously for people to improve. But if you do, if you are managing someone out, having those warnings and steps and documented goals, it's an eno- of enormous assistance in uh, the proof question of whether the person does in fact have the capacity or was meeting those goals. So in terms of performance. I'm very committed to this being under an hour, as you can see by the speed that I'm going through it, incidentally. What I'd suggest is if you can, if you get in early enough, a performance improvement plan is the correct strategy, and that should be approached in a really genuine way. It's not, it, it, can be, it can lead to people being managed out of an organisation, but you do never know, and they only work and they only appear genuine and come across as genuine if they are, if there's a real commitment to helping the person improve if you can. The second thing is, just in case that doesn't work and they don't improve, document everything. There's a reason these performance improvement plans drift and they fall over and you just, they run for months and it's because nobody wants to have this meeting where you talk to someone about tedious things that they should know how to do. You've got to keep keep writing everything down, keep monitoring and following up throughout the process. That's performance. The more interesting part of the talk is about procedural fairness. There's two important, there's essentially whether a dismissal is unfair or not is going to turn on two factors. Firstly, whether there was a valid reason for the termination and secondly, whether it was otherwise harsh, unjust or unreasonable, which all sounds very good, but is um, a little bit more difficult when you get into the detail. One of the, one of the reasons a dismissal has been found to be unreasonable on a previous construction, it's why Byrne is in there, is because the material that was available didn't support the claim because you never asked the employee for their point of view. You didn't give them a chance to respond to the allegation. You didn't take their point of view into account. Um, same with uh, self These These are sort of reflexively cited in more or less every commission decision. They're of increasingly limited utility, I think, in the current statutory regime. Before we get to the current statutory regime, um, we're going to start with the extremely topical Industrial Relations Act 1993. Uh, The point of this is not just because I'm interested in it, but it does illustrate the change that's undergone and some of the difficulties you have in the Commission when you're appearing in front of members who have been in the Commission since this Act was enacted and this approach to unfair dismissals was the case and have not in fact changed their approach because why would they? They've been doing it fine for one million years. This is the old construction of valid reason. There's a fairly long historical run up to this, but this is where it was immediately before the significant change in 1996. You'll notice it's different in one, in one really significant way from the current construction, which, which that it's a prohibition on termination unless you can establish valid reason. That's a much more clear casting of the onus on employers than we have now. You turn up, you have to demonstrate that there was, that you had a reason for sacking them. It wasn't just a whim, but also that that reason was a good one. You then have statutory exclusion, I suppose, to when a reason will be valid, harsh, unjust and unreasonable. And that brings in those concepts in the cases in the slide before Byrne, self and the, the litany that goes on through there. Under this conception, you could sack someone for the best possible reason in the world. And it is possible that if you do not do it in a procedurally fair way, you do it in such an unfair, humiliating, aggressive way, whatever, that will not be a valid reason. That's the old concept of it. This changes. There is a process of inversion and unpacking of these concepts as we move to an increasing statutory codification of unfair dismissals. The 1996 Workplace Relations Act, I should say that there are significant changes to the entire unfair dismissal jurisdiction with this legislation that I'm not going to go into. They relate in particular to the role of employee organisations in bringing and enforcing these claims and that move to a more individualistic um, remedy-based approach. Uh, But for today's purposes, looking at whether a termination is harsh, unjust and unreasonable, you see immediately it's more familiar. It looks much more like Section 387 and that's because it's unpacked before. Firstly, you think, well, was there a valid reason? It's going to be of some significance. And then secondly, B through E, all the other components of harshness, of unjustness that were previously within that concept. So if something's unfair because of the process that's been followed, that no longer affects the question of valid reason. And this has obviously, and has in fact, 
had a really significant impact on the way these run and the way the jurisdiction works for applicants. This is expanded in the Fair Work Act 2009. The Fair Work Act is, oh, there's one um, interesting deviation. You'll see here in A, or to the operational requirements of the employer's undertaking. Um, this act is before codification of redundancy entitlements in statute. So that's what that part is talking about. That's removed from section 387 because redundancy is, if genuine, and some protections are still in there, excluded from the category of dismissals that can possibly be unfair. It's the same, it, apart from that, the provisions are essentially repeated, except for these sections in red. They're new. They have some significance, particularly F and G, in the question of procedural fairness, because they are intended to and have balance out different employer capacities. That's done to some extent in the old legislation. You'd have to take into account people's size, whether they're, you know, a three man transport company that can't tick the right form in a box or warn their world's most hopeless salesperson. Um, but it's, it's now an express requirement to consider whether this is a big business or a small business, whether they've got HR or not, in the weighing exercise as to why, why it's unfair. It is meant to be a weighing exercise in theory. Every single one of those criteria can be given equal weight. Any one of them can make a dismissal unfair. Any one of them can be so significant as to render it fair. Um, you see in Parmalat and Tran, a fella um, driving a forklift around a milk factory, Parmalat, he messes up the coupling connection and backs in too hard and milk is everywhere. And some might say, no use crying over spilled milk. He took a different view and ran an unfair dismissal. One at first instance comes up to a full bench in front of Vice President Watson, whose previous decision on this point also Parmalat, as the appellant, Parmalat and Willalow, had said, valid reason is the thing. It is everything we talk about. Once you have a valid reason, it would, have to, it would be extraordinary circumstances for that to, be, um, that to be outweighed. Changes his mind a bit in Tran, and now we suddenly get the concept of the not very important valid reason. We're moving more towards the idea that, well, you know, it's a valid reason on a technical point. It's misconduct. Um, that's been quite significant in recent decisions, particularly drug testing cases. Uh, there's, be, there's a line of full bench decisions about people who test non-negative for cannabis. It's a significant drug because it stays in your bloodstream for a long time. The tests that detect it have, it is established and relatively uncontroversial, no connection to impairment. So you cannot say we have sacked this person for turning up impaired at work or under the influence of drugs. What you do is we've sacked them for contravening a policy which says that you will not return a non-negative test, which is inherently a less serious thing than being impaired at work. But it meant, but this this lower threshold, you go, well, it's you know it's a breach of policy, but we take it seriously. It doesn't work like that for reasons I'll get into. Um, Diaz and ANSPAC services, uh, it's, um, it, it's reiterated there that no greater or lesser weight be assigned to paragraph A. That takes Parmalat and Tran to its next step, and this is where it's starting to get, I think, a bit silly. They go, well, absolutely equal weight. That makes sense in one direction, where you go, I've found a valid reason. Nevertheless, all these other factors, the, every, all the procedural stuff, everything that comes in under H, mean that it's unfair, that's conventional. But it has to work if that sentence, I was in Diaz and I lost it and I'm still really angry about it because this is stupid. Um, it has to work the other way that if you, there's no valid reason, but it's the most, somehow the most procedurally fair dismissal in the world, it's somehow not unfair. That's obviously a nonsense. You it, it, it is a weighing exercise, but a threshold question has to be the existence of some justification for the dismissal. In terms of procedural fairness and its significance in the weighing exercise, again, it, it, is, it, just, it just bears no resemblance to what that decision put forward. Um, Mislov is a South Australian decision from 2001. It's not any use anymore, but it's up there because it illustrates what a shift we've had. Uh, what you have there is genuine shock from a full bench of the South Australian Industrial Commission. Many of the members on it are still members of the commission today. Commissioner Bartell dissented, I think. I think it was Bartell that dissented. Um, 
they go, well, this shocking concept that something that was procedurally unfair, that was otherwise within that category of harshness or unjustness, could nevertheless still be fair. Now, of course, that's now completely common. Procedural fairness is, is, of, is of less significance in unfair dismissal decisions. This is an important thing to remember when preparing material. They're perhaps focusing too much on procedural defects is a mistake for both parties. For employers, it's a waste of your time. It's only going to highlight where the process that you say you followed has failed. It gives the applicant the opportunity to criticise that step by step and it changes the focus. For the applicant, it's just not going to be a winner. It looks like um, it is, it's the last resort in some ways, going, well, I accept that I did the wrong thing, but, geez, they were rude to me when they gave me the letter. It's not a particularly compelling argument. What to do? Some things are good ideas. Giving people warnings is one, where the situation warrants it. But there's an exception to this. You don't have to warn someone not to commit serious misconduct. There are certain things that are so outrageous that do, do merit instant dismissal. Again, with Crozier, sometimes things are just obvious and they should know better. That it would be best if you'd warned them, but it wouldn't have made, in practical terms, a difference. Secondly, it's a nice idea to give them an opportunity to respond. This isn't going to be fatal. It's only if you, if you fail to do that, if you do march them out without asking their side of the story, if there is no universe in which their side of the story would have made a difference. No, it's a step-by-step -step process. Um, the support person, this is very fraught in some industries and then in, 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 in sort of 10% everyone cares a lot and then 90% everyone behaves themselves. There's a conflict between whether someone's allowed to have a support person with them, to sit next to them, take notes, ask questions, take breaks, or a representative who acts for them and speaks for them and does all that sort of thing. My view on this has always been who cares. If someone wants a representative, let them have a representative. It's not going to make a tremendous amount of difference in the end. And if you're an employer, you'll look fantastic. What kind of representative is going to possibly alter the decision or disrupt the process that much? I say that I have seen a representative disrupt a process so much that he turned a very well planned probably going to be fair dismissal into a spectacularly unfair dismissal just because he wound up how it seemed to have gone down. They had this guy. They had Facebook photos of him saying terrible things, they may have been true, but terrible things about his manager, terrible things about his co-workers on his Facebook page. He's friends with everyone. His profile picture is him wearing his work uniform. He's got the logo there. It's in his info. It's the, the, he's the kind of guy who... Sh it's, it, shouldn't have Facebook but has somehow stumbled into it and managed to make the page and he's liked, he's made friends with 12 people and liked 600 pages of jokes and it's a disaster. They absolutely had him on this. But the representative is so difficult that he just winds this HR manager up that they, they never reveal the reason. They just, here's your thing, you're gone, see you later, nothing like that. And they forgot to, um, they forgot to give him the actual documents which was pretty impressive. It wasn't intentional, but uh, it, did have, it did have an effect. Also, don't have secret meetings where the, the um, reconstructions of events in safety breaches where people are, where, where it matters where things were and where people were standing at a particular time. Meetings with everyone except the person accused of a particular kind of misconduct to get the story, always a bad idea. Doing all those things doesn't add a tremendous amount of time to dismissal. If you get in an advance and you can get your client to take these steps, even though they're usually furious, um, and as I say, when they have already sacked him because they're furious and they're just trying to get you to piece it together, it's important to remember the role this currently plays in the jurisdiction, which is relatively minimal. There are some things that remain a bad idea to do. This slide doesn't make sense, as I just saw that, so enjoy that. Um, <laughs> yes, what I think I meant was that you shouldn't do things where to do otherwise would have made a noticeable difference, and that, that's an, that can be an act or an omission. Don't not interview the person where it'll be significant in the context of a decision if the person isn't interviewed where their view could have influenced the decision maker, where it's a he said, she said kind of case where, the, as I said before, a reconstruction where they could have said, well, in fact, I was over here. How much that's going to weigh in terms of procedural fairness alone, I think, again, is pretty minimal. Anything like that, where it go, that goes to, I didn't do it. It's more, it's more significant to valid reason. Um, avoid surprises. 
Serco. This um, Miss Waite, it's a recent decision. Miss Waite fell asleep at work. Security guard, it's a, it's a big deal. She is only caught because they are conducting covert surveillance on a different employee who they thought was stealing things, who incidentally was stealing things. It's a very successful surveillance operation. They also get a photo of her head down. But they do everything wrong. They have a secret meeting. They bring her in. They have the meeting going, did you do anything wrong on Thursday? No. OK, see you later. Um, bring her in for the dismissal meeting and then show her the photos in this sort of dramatic, ha-ha, you were asleep. You know, we're, we're not actually interested in anything you have to say. I wasn't asleep. I'm resting my head, anything like that. You're gone. Um, she won her case. Did not get a job back, I think, but it was it, it was a significant enough, enough failure of procedural fairness that you, you get some. She did get some compensation. I'll come to remedy to finish in a moment. I mean, I've said harshness there, but it, it, it's a question of feel. The act still has a fair go all round as the guiding principle of unfair dismissals. A lot of these things are. You're dealing with a mixed bag of commissioners increasingly. Some of them legally trained, some of them worked as lawyers their entire life, some of them a, a range of different experiences in a range of different industries, some of them in a separate category, which given we're being recorded I won't discuss. Um, but it does come down to ultimately a value judgment and a lot of it's about feel, a lot of it's about how this person's been treated, whether there's some inherent reasonableness to the decision. These things, though, these are very difficult to recover from if your client comes and says, I have sacked someone, also, here's how I did it. Is this OK? Are we going to be OK? Uh, the kind of people who do these, to be fair, generally don't seek legal advice and run fantastic self-represented cases and just cut up and so the decision's good fun. Text message dismissals, this is dumb. This is dumb on a number of levels because it removes the procedural fairness. <laughs> aspect of it. It's really rude. People think it's weird. Many of the Commission members are not totally clear on what a text message is. It's like, how could they possibly have received this notification through some sort of magic device? Um, my, uh, one, one that I like is Maynard and inner city towing. The guy is a tow truck driver, no surprise. He drives his tow truck around. They communicate by text all the time. He's having a disagreement with his employer about whether he did or did not steal $500. That conflict despite an appeal, a, a first instance hearing, an appeal, a rehearing, is never resolved because rather than investigate the theft of the $500, the employer gets so agitated that this guy is being difficult about this accusation that he sends him a text message going, listen, C word, again, we're being recorded. You're not welcome in the yard anymore. Drop the keys to the truck around and, I'll, and you know, we'll, we'll speak never, which, um, it was great fun to read out 17 times during the course of the hearing at him. It did, he did argue that it wasn't a dismissal, but they, they did find that calling someone that and also removing their tool of trade was probably the end of the employment relationship. But it's hard to recover from that kind of really out there behaviour. Abusive text messages, a slightly different category from the text message dismissals. Hairdressers are really into this for some reason. There's been a run of them recently. These, uh, they tend to be small operations and they're very close friends, they all work together and then the relationship goes badly. And they send each other like pages and pages of excitable Facebook messages going, you'll never work in this town again, you know, I'll ruin your hairdressing career in Port Pirie or whatever's happening. And again, very difficult to walk back from. You can. So sometimes the best thing to do is concede um, that there's, it's been procedurally unfair and just run really hard on valid reason, really hard on would it have made a difference correspondingly for an applicant. I have no idea who does applicant or respondent work. Focusing too much on that, if you've provoked, for example, the abusive text message or you're enthusiastically engaging in the Facebook conversation, well, maybe. And again, public humiliation, the kind of thing where you walk them out, they don't get to say goodbye, they're escorted out by security, you don't give them their stuff back. It's just, again, it's about the vibe, unfortunately, in this area. This is the final thing I want to say. You've established valid reason, but you ha your, your client has conducted themselves objectively atrociously. They have treated this person terribly. They've driven by their house, yelling at them after the dismissal. You know, that, again, a real example. People are absolutely mad. You know, that, that if, you're, if you're stuck, you're going, this has been so terrible that they're just going to find it's unfair. The question is, well, how long? 
if I'd, if I'd run the Rolls Royce, this company had run the Rolls Royce of dismissal procedures, we'd brought them in, had a meeting, thought about it, sacked them, one to two weeks. If you can really establish that it was going to happen and it's a question of form, you're looking at very, very minimal compensation orders. Um, for anyone that's not familiar with it, compensation in the unfair dismissal jurisdiction is fundamentally predicated on an expected period of continuous employment. It's how long you would have worked there but for the dismissal, minus anything you've earned in the interim, deductions for contingencies, deductions for you being terrible, misconduct is the, the technical term. Um, if you can establish that, thanks, they, they would have been there for 48 hours, then you're looking at a minimal award. An increasingly common outcome, common's wrong, but certainly more frequent than it used to be is the technical victory for employees on procedural points, the, well, well done, you've convinced me that that was a complete denial of procedural fairness. You're still not a chartered accountant. I do not award any compensation. And so that remains an option. That's it for me, unless there are any questions, or alternatively, we can do questions at the end. Okay, thank you very much. I have a question for the audience. At least those of you who are practice um, sometimes or all the time in this area. What, what are you saying to clients about procedural fairness, especially in misconduct cases? So forget about performance for a moment. But in misconduct cases, when you know you've got to prove that the person you know, stole or breached a procedure, whatever it was, and you, you think you're okay on that front, but the procedure's dicey, what, what are you saying to procedure took two years to unfold and that created unfairness apart from anything else because by the time it's come on for hearing it's three years after these events and the person's trying to give evidence about who was standing where when a train you know came through a particular point and the fact that the process took that long to unfold itself created an unfairness for the employee. <coughs> I have to say I'm, I'm not sure the argument's going to go very far but I'll give it a go. Um, so um, Lucy um, just spoke to you about um, really unfair dismissal 
I wanted to deal with the other um, very common employment um, action, which is adverse action, part 3-1 of the Fair Work Act. Now, before I get into it, can I just repeat the survey that I did when about half of you were here? How many people here would um, call themselves employment lawyers or commonly deal with employment issues? Do we have any construction specialists? General commercial litigators? Some people who are in none of, none of those categories. Is everyone here definitely a lawyer? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so look, the reason that I ask is yeah, th there's sometimes a difficult balance in these sorts of talks between yeah, explaining the basics for the people who yeah, want to know something about the area and um, not boring to death the people that know all of that and are really interested in getting into the more <coughs> um, technical aspects of, um, of the, the, um, the topic, but um, I'll do my best. Um, now, I, I say this every time I give a talk, and I don't think it's ever happened, but tonight might be the night. If you have a thought, question, disagreement, comment, whatever, as I'm going, just put your hand up. And I'd, I'd much rather have more of a discussion than a lecture. So please don't be shy. As I said, it's, it's never happened yet, but you never know. Um, one, one day it might. Um, now, can I just tell you what my perspective is on um, these issues? I worked for a union and an employer law firm before I came to the bar. And at the bar, I, I practice a lot in this area, and my practice is pretty much 50-50 employee, employer. So um, that's where I'm coming from. I think I've seen it from both sides, although I tend to see the cases once everything's really gone poorly and it's being litigated, and often it's halfway to um, hearing. So one of the things I'm interested in um, knowing is the perspective from a bit earlier in the process when perhaps a, a ideally a worker hasn't been um, punted or if they have its early days and you're maybe trying to resolve it without having to go um, too far down um, the litigation path. Um, okay. Now I, I spent ages on on this, and I'm not sure it's really was worthwhile, um, <laughs> including because I identified the wrong part. Yeah. <laughs> That's one of the problems. Um, there are others, but there is a point, um, which is that these these adverse action provisions they've been on the books probably for a hundred years in one form or another. And for whatever reason, when they were reproduced and expanded in the Fair Work Act, there was a lot of angst about, especially from the respondent side, the employer side, about how oppressive they were, about how it's going to be impossible to defend these cases and so on. And I'm really not at all sure that's true. In fact, I, it seems to me from a respondent's point of view, a lot of these cases can be managed relatively um, comfortably, assuming the employer has not, you know, really misbehaved. And it, it's, it's where sometimes you get people who have really done the wrong thing, but usually people are doing their best and um, you're in a, a grey area as opposed to someone who's, you know, an out-and-out -out villain. Um, so that, that's the point. Is I'm not sure these provisions are really as worrisome as um, sometimes um, they're advertised um, to be. Now, can we run through the provisions um, fairly briefly? I, I, I think we can do this quickly because on one level they're um, straightforward. I'm going to skate over some of the detail, but I, I don't think we need it for um, our purposes today. Um, the first couple of provisions are 340 and 346, and I'll sort of lump them together. The, the prohibition, and this is unlawful conduct we should bear in mind, as opposed to unfair dismissal. It's, it's not unlawful to unfairly dismiss someone it is unlawful to take adverse action against a person. Now the prohibition is against taking adverse action, which is its dismissal, obviously, but it's other conduct that injures an employee in their employment, demotion, transfers, um, on one view, warnings, um, initiating disciplinary processes. There are arguments about those things, but it's really anything that um, harms an employee in their employment. Now, that adverse action should not be taken 
because certain things. Now it seems like such a simple word and um, it's not. In this area, like many others, causation is really um, one of the most difficult um, issues um, we grapple with. Now the prohibitions against taking adverse action because the person <coughs> has firstly um, a workplace right. Now, um, again, th there are some complexities to this, but um, basically you have a workplace right. If you have a statutory entitlement, for example, to annual leave, you have an entitlement under an enterprise um, agreement. And broadly, if you make a complaint or an inquiry about your employment, so um, don't like my boss, want a pay rise, um, we should do things differently, they're probably all in the category of workplace rights. So you can't take adverse action because someone um, takes annual leave, for example. Or can you? Um, the second um, prohibited ground is industrial activity, which is basically union activity. Membership, um, participation in union um, business, um, participation in lawful industrial action going on strike, and so on and so forth. So uh, that's the first um, broad category of adverse action. The second, and sometimes even the, those of us who practice a lot in this area don't think about uh, Section 351 very much. The second prohibition is taking adverse action um, against an, an employee or prospective employee because of the usual grounds of discrimination that have been in different statutes for many years. Now at first glance it looks like this provision really just reproduces what appears in the state and federal discrimination laws and I'm not sure that's right and that's something I want to um, raise with you towards the end of um, this talk. Now that's the general prohibition in this, call it discrimination, it's not quite but it's close enough. That's 3511, that's the general prohibition there are some exceptions. Um, one is if the action is not unlawful under any anti-discrimination law. Now, I, 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 this provision really did my head in. I just couldn't understand what the point of it was. Does it mean that if you're to succeed under 3511, you have to also prove that the conduct's unlawful under every other law that deals with the issue? And if so, how could you ever succeed in one of these cases? Now, the answer, of course, is that's not what it's about. It's about conduct which is specifically authorised under other discrimination legislation. So really affirmative action, apparently there are some WHS laws that authorise particular conduct that might be discriminatory. It's those things that the first exclusion is concerned with. And the second, um, and it, this is really um, mostly deals with the disability, perhaps the gender um, um, grounds family and carer's responsibilities. The adverse action is not unlawful if it's taken because of the inherent requirements of the particular position. And, and that's a familiar exception, certainly in the disability discrimination field and has always travelled with the prohibition. So if you're a person with a wooden leg and you know, you're working around termites, it might be a problem, you might not be able to carry out the job, and if so, it's obviously it's a matter of common sense that um, discrimination would be permitted um, in that sort of um, context. Um, some other um, uh, provisions that um, matter, one's the multiple reasons for action, so the, the prohibited basis need not be the only basis for action, so if you sack someone because they're in the union and because you needed to make someone redundant, that's unlawful. And of course the you know, reverse onus is once the allegations uh, is made that there has been adverse action, the onus shifts to the um, respondent, the employer, usually, although not always, sometimes unions are um, pursued under these provisions, sometimes individuals, but in any case the onus shifts um, to the other um, party. This is another, okay, th this didn't take me as long as the first one, <laughs> but it, it probably works, um, it's probably even worse than the original one, but this is John Setka, who's a well-known union uh, leader, and look, 
but as I said, these provisions, and especially the reverse onus, for whatever reason, gets people really excited about, you know, people are going to be making these claims, there's a reverse onus, we've got to disprove it just as long as it's alleged. And there was yeah. a concern that, you know, the floodgates would open and yeah, so on and so forth. And on one level you can see why, because the definition of adverse action is, is broad, the category of workplace rights is um, broad, and the um, reverse onus is not insignificant, but um, I think e even so, despite the existence of the reverse onus, it's, it's, it's really, from an employer's point of view, if, you, if you've done the right thing, sometimes even if you haven't, it's, it's not the end of the world to be um, sued in adverse action. Um, now, just trying to talk about what practically happens in, in these cases and to try to put those provisions into a, a practical context. But my experience is that there are other examples, but usually in adverse action cases, one of two things. Either you, know, you sacked me, and you said it was because I was redundant, but you really sacked me because I complained about my manager two weeks ago. And then you just have an argument about, well, what was the real reason? Was the person really redundant, or is that told I've wandered off camera? So, how do you know? Well, because the camera wasn't there, and you also thought of it. I can't say I'm too concerned. Yeah, so, first category is usually it's just a pure factual dispute about um, what was the real um, reason, and this is where you get into usually really turns on discovery. Someone's, someone sent an email saying, can't believe, you know, she did this, I'm going to get rid of her, I'm going to, you know, make her redundant next week. Applicants in good um, position. If you don't have that sort of smoking gun or um, own goal, it's pretty difficult from an employee's point of view, but you know, occasionally those cases succeed. Uh, the second category, and perhaps the more interesting one, and from a technical point of view, are the cases where there's no real doubt about the reason for dismissal, but the arguments about um, whether um, the dismissal is um, in fact for a prohibited reason. Now let's deal with some examples. For those of you who um, operate in this area, they will be familiar, they should be. Um, for those of you who, who don't, I'm interested in, in your reaction. So, now, first scenario, the employer is going through some sort of audit required by government. The audit requires input from employees in this organisation. At some point during the process, the union delegate writes to all the union members on an email above his signature as union <coughs> vice president or whatever it was, and says, I've heard reports that there's pressure on workers to falsify documents or accounts or whatever it is. Um, don't, um, don't be involved in any of that. If you're pressured to do it, don't uh, come and talk to the union. Now, uh, the employer responded by beginning a disciplinary process on the basis that the email had the potential to bring the employer into disrepute, which we certainly did. employment people, maybe just stay out of this unless you don't recognise the facts. Does anyone else want to um, tell me whether they reckon this is a prohibited reason? It's an email to union members on union letterhead, effectively, dealing with an issue that's certainly union uh, business, but it did potentially bring the employer into disrepute. What's your instinctive reaction? industrial action, it's a picket, people stand on the picket holding up signs as is traditional, one of the signs says scab or scabs or death to scabs or something, scab, 
scare quite. In this hypothetical situation. Right. Uh, the manager, is, it wasn't Dr. Brick, it was Mr. Brick, drives past, sees the sign, uh, and cut a long story short, sacks the worker because the sign was offensive, humiliating, intimidating, contrary to code of conduct, so on and so forth. Okay. Lawful or unlawful? No doubt the industrial action was protected. It was definitely a union gig. Everyone was standing around you know, with their signs, some of which were offensive and some were less offensive. Protected or no? What are the employment terms? No? It's fine? Right. Now, the employee, uh, presumably in a mine or something like that, works a seven day roster, is off work repeatedly over a fairly short period on sick leave, which he was entitled to take. He's <coughs> right under probably the Act might have been an enterprise agreement. After his misses X number of days in a month, or it's quite a few, the employer says, look, I'm putting you on a different roster. I need the people on this roster to actually turn up for work as rostered moving into this different roster, as I'm entitled to do, it cost the employee some non-insignificant amount of money, he or his union suits. Lawful or unlawful? Well, look up. I'll, I'll tell you the answer in each case is that there wasn't <coughs> unlawful adverse action, and these cases will, will be very familiar, at least the first two, um, to those of you who work in this area. Um, Barclay was the first one, and it's a lot of president who sent the email saying there's talk about all this, um, uh, this fraud, um, don't um, participate. He lost at first instance, won on appeal, 2-1, and then lost in the High Court, 7-7. Um, um, nil. The second case, BHP Coal, was the Mr. Brick, the scab um, sign. He lost at first instance, lost on appeal as well, I think, um, and lost in the High Court, although only uh, narrowly three to two. And then Endeavour Coal, and these obviously are in chronological order, Endeavour Coal was the last one where the person had been on roster took leave that they're entitled to take um, was transferred. Uh, I have to say I thought that one was very close and I think the special leave application was um, finally balanced and if there were two different judges hearing that special leave application it might have gone differently. It might also have gone differently if these cases were in reverse order because to my thinking I can see exactly where the court was coming from in Barclay probably see where they're coming from in BHP, although that's more finely balanced. But when you get down to Endeavour Coal, it's really, I think, starting to expose some of the, the, the weakness in the reasoning um, in Barclay, which was, in short, that look, the fact that the conduct was capable of being characterised as industrial activity or an exercise of workplace right or whatever else is one thing, but that's not conclusive. And if the decision maker comes along and says, that's not the reason, I don't care that the bloke was in a union, was on strike, or that the lady took annual leave, or whatever it was, I dismissed because there was a breach of code of conduct, or because I just needed the person to turn up to work, or some variation thereof, there's no adverse action. So the full federal court in Barclay had said, basically, the decision maker might have said, it's not because he was in the union, it was because he brought the organisation into disrepute, at least the majority, two of the three, said it doesn't matter. That she might have honestly believed that, but the reality is it was union business and you can't dissociate that from, uh, you can't dissociate the prohibited character from the other non-prohibited reason. And that's, that's what the High Court rejected in Barclay and said it's about the decision maker's actual reason and the fact that the conduct could be characterised differently and makes um, no difference. And there, there were 
a number of judgments, um, but all to the same effect, at least in Barclay, not necessarily in the other um, two cases. And this is, um, this is French and Crenham, and this is, if, if you were sitting down to prepare your evidence to deal with one of these cases, I think this would be your starting point. You'd go back, refresh your memory of this as you worked out what you needed um, to deal with in your evidence. Um, questions one of fact, which must be answered in light of all the facts established in the proceeding, the usual completely unhelpful um, statement. Um, more helpfully, it will be difficult to displace the presumption if no direct testimony is given by the decision maker. Direct evidence, um, which may include positive evidence that the action wasn't taken for a prohibited reason, may be unreliable because of other contradictory evidence given by that person or because of other objective facts. But direct testimony, which is accepted as reliable, is capable of discharging the burden, and I interpolate, in fact, will discharge the burden um, upon an employer, even though the employee, in this case, the issue was a member of um, an officer and member of a union and engaged in um, industrial activity. Now, that was um, Barclay, and look, it, it makes a lot of sense. It, what the employee did in that case wasn't the most egregious species of misconduct that's ever been seen, but if you took the example a bit further and the you know, Mr Barclay had you know, made allegations of serious you know, criminal activity by his employer in connection with that union business on his union letterhead, it would be pretty hard to say the employer could not take any action because it was union business and therefore it was magically cloaked in protection. So it all makes perfect sense um, at that stage, as does um, the explanation that's given by French and Crennan. Um, this is BHP Cole, the scab case, where you start to, it, it gets a bit trickier, at least uh, to my mind. The guy's standing in the middle of the union picket, holding up a sign. Um, it, it's very much industrial activity. Um, but nonetheless, he was um, punted. And in this case, Crennan said um, something. Um, the decision maker can assert that the conduct wasn't taken for a prohibited reason. It would be open to a court to accept that as honest, but not to be satisfied that the employer had discharged its reverse owners. Now, that's what Justice Crennan um, said. Uh, Buchanan and Tracy, in a later decision in the full federal court, um, dealt with that um, in an unusual paragraph because it's not that often that you get federal court judges saying that a high court judge um, was wrong, um, but they did, and again, you can see why. And I think this is the current state of the law that if you accept, if the person comes along and says, I didn't do it for a prohibited reason, and that evidence is accepted as being honest, game over. That's the end of it. Right. Forget about it. If the person's believed, you win. If they're disbelieved, as an employer, you probably lose. It's conceivable that other evidence could discharge the onus, but those cases will be few and far um, between. So to my mind, the current state of the law is that if the person gives the evidence, it's the right evidence and they're believed, that's it. And that's why I say on one level, this is actually simpler than um, it appears. Um, now, uh, having said that, can I immediately identify a problem? Um, there will be complications, for example, cases where you have um, multiple um, decision makers, and it's important in that case, or even where you have an individual decision maker, the evidence has to be not only this was the reason that I did what I did, and it was because you know, we had to save costs or because they held up an offensive sign or dressed up in a rat outfit or whatever it is. But you have to go another step and say, and the reason that's alleged was no part of it, because bear in mind, there might be a perfectly legitimate reason for the conduct, but if there's another lurking in the background or foreground or to the side, if there's another prohibited reason um, in play, 
then um, because of Section 360, the conduct is still um, unlawful. So the evidence has to go that two steps. One, what was the reason? And secondly, um, uh, the, the, what alleged against me was not a reason um, for my um, conduct. So what does that actually mean when you sit down to work out what evidence you're going to give? Or where an employer comes to you and says, Look, we're thinking about sacking this person, um, we've got a letter from the union or the person's solicitor or whatever else saying this is adverse action if you sack them um, and we're going to sue you if you go through with it. So what do you need to do? Sorry if I'm stating the obvious work out who's the decision maker. Sometimes it'll be very clear if you're a you know, one, one man band or a one person um, employer, there's only one possibility. If you're in a bigger organisation, um, it, um, it can be less straightforward. And bear in mind that someone might sign the letter of dismissal or say I'm the person with responsibility to hire and fire or whatever it is, but are they really the decision maker This is not a straightforward um, issue, and there are a, a couple of cases, although not very many, dealing with it. I'll, I'll just give you the probably the starting point because it's the most recent decision is Clermont, um, CFMEU and Clermont, C L E R M O N T, um, Cole, and there Justice Reeves deals with this issue. The short version is if someone is making a decision that meaningfully contributes to the ultimate decision, then they're, they're effectively, this isn't quite right, but they're effectively a decision maker. And if they have some prohibited reason that affects their analysis or their calculus, that will impugn the ultimate decision, even if the ultimate decision maker doesn't know about it. So if the supervisors, the workers complain about the supervisor, the supervisor is the person that calculates the scores for the retrenchment matrix and hands that up to site manager. Site manager might know nothing about the disagreement between these two down on the shop floor, but that decision is affected by the potential for the animus of the supervisor. So if you are in that kind of situation, you really have to think carefully about who's really making the decision, who's meaningfully contributing to the decision, and make sure that you have evidence from them. Apart from that, it's really um, common sense. But what are the reasons that are given? Um, have you excluded the possibility of um, prohibited reasons? And does it all make sense? Now, this, it's, it's not rocket science, right? Now, on one level, it doesn't matter whether the decision's fair or rational or whatever else. If you're in adverse action, very narrow question, which is, was there a prohibited reason? But if the person's employee of the year, 10 years straight, and you then say you're sacked because of poor performance, you're going to have a problem getting the, the tribunal to accept the evidence that that was a prohibited reason. That's a, it's a really obvious and silly example, but, yeah. but that's the, the type of analysis or critical thought that you need to go through when you're looking at the reasons. And I think that means people will come along and 
say, you know, the reasons are X, Y, Z, the law sound perfectly plausible. And then when you get the other side's evidence, or when you get your own material in discovery, it's my favourite, then you realise there's actually a lot more going on than you first met the eye. And to my mind, you really need to get to the bottom of that early. And you have to, because the client's not going to be critically, they're not going to really ask themselves if they're acting or they're unlawful. You have to do it, and I think if you can, you want to get the emails that have bounced around, messages, whatever's out there that could um, give you a nasty surprise um, down the track. So, um, really common sense, but it, um, it has to be done, and if it is done, the client's probably going to be fine. Um, can I just deal with one um, more scenario? Section 351 that I say we overlook. Work is off work because of an injury. Assume it's not work related. Employer, as always happens, writes and says, yeah, we want you to come and see our doctor because we want to know exactly what's wrong with you. The employee, as always, doesn't want to do it. To and fro, the employee drags their heels for a couple of months, eventually says, fine, I'll do it. The employee says, all right, we'll contact you later time for this examination. Two months goes past, nothing happens. The employer writes to the employee and says, um, we're sacking you for these reasons. Um, you're uncooperative in our attempts to get you to the examination and we've got serious concerns about your capacity to return to work. Lawful or law unlawful? No mention and look at, assume the injuries are psychological. Assume it's severe depression. Right. Letter doesn't say anything about it. It says serious concerns about capacity to return and uncooperative and assume that that's actually true. Assume this was the case that I ran in the federal court three weeks ago and is currently reserved. What do you reckon? Tell you what, assume the decision maker comes along, there's just one, and she comes along and she gives evidence that the reasons stated in the letter were true, and that evidence is not actually challenged by the applicant's barrister, which is this guy. So this is there's no question about the veracity of this. That is the stated reason, it is in fact the reason. Landers people. The truth is, um, no one knows, but I'll tell you um, what I think. Um, the applicant why I acted for said breach of 351, can't take adverse action because of disability. Employer said we didn't sack you because you were severely depressed. We have plenty of employees that have all kinds of problems and we've never taken action against them. We sacked you because you couldn't perform the inherent requirements, the first of which is physically being at work, sitting at the computer, typing away, whatever it was he did. And they said, on that basis, it's not for the prohibited reason, but even if it was, we get the 351 subsection 2 inherent requirements and things. Yeah. Let me just tell you what I think is the state of the law on this very strange um, section. And perhaps this, for the employment people here, this might actually be something mildly interesting as opposed to some of the other things we've spoken about. Um, this is what I think is the current state of the law. Firstly, unlike the case of, say, annual leave, where you can distinguish between the fact of it being sick leave, say, I don't care if it's sick leave, what I'm concerned about is the absence from work. There's no capacity to do that in the concept of, in the context of disability discrimination, because the condition and the manifestation are, as a matter of language, the same thing. Right? The disability is the inability to do something. It's not the depression, it's, well, it's the depression, but it's also the inability to work because of the depression. So that fine distinction, that very fine slicing of uh, K 
characterization that you get in the Barclay and BH, and especially Endeavour, you don't get um, in this context. And the second is disability. This is uncontroversial. Is the disability was a factor. Then it's a 360. Um, and it's uh, unlawful. And, and then this is the weird thing. When you think about the inherent requirements of things, the question isn't could the person actually do the job, but did the decision maker think they could do the job? And that's completely different to disability discrimination laws, where the question is, could this one-legged man actually work as a fireman, or whatever it might be? The question isn't, could they actually do it? It was, did the decision maker think they could do it? Now, why would that be the statutory criterion? Idea, there's a real policy question about why that, that would be so, but it's the same hinge because, and given the analysis in all the 340 and 346 cases, it's the same um, issue. It's did the, did the decision maker think that the person was incapable of doing the job? Um, and can I tell you, decisions reserved, who knows what will happen? But I think we've got to win because the employer said we're unsure about your fitness. And before they'd done that, they'd said, we want you to go to work because we don't know whether you're fit or not. That's why we're sending you to the medical examination. And that's why we really embrace these reasons. These, we're not sure whether you can work because, counterintuitive as it was, Got us, it got us home on inherent requirements because whether he could do the job or not, and he was off work for seven months, and his medical certificates all said he can't work, so pretty good reason to think he couldn't. But the employer had said, We're not sure, and that's why we said we had to succeed. But we'll find out in due course it's Robinson and Western Union Business Services, it'll be a decision of justice. Sorry to have gone out over time. They're the decisions that stand for these uh, propositions. Uh, but that's, that's all I wanted to say about that. Questions, comments, complaints, criticisms? We'll take those in writing. I don't want them in writing, but you can send them to Lisa. Um, thank you for coming. Please stay um, and um, have a drink. And to chat about any of these issues or whatever, the World Cup or whatever else is on your mind. Thanks very much.